everybody. This is Dusty Miller, and he's going to give us an introduction talk on a deep dive in Sysmon. So take it away whenever you're ready. Hi, right, Dusty. Um, so wanted to go through and talk about Sysmon. It's a tool that, or a tool that a lot of cup, a lot of talks talk about, but not many organizations end up actually implementing in their as one of the tools they use um so sysmon is a to me best described as a log enhancement it is built by sys internals of windows um and just a lot of the logs it shows can be done through windows event logging but it's much harder to configure through Windows event logging as opposed to just running Sysmon. Um, one of the biggest things about it is how highly configurable it, it is. You can include and exclude individual IPs, um, applications, files. Um, there's two big configurations out there that a lot of people base theirs off of one by uh, Olaf Hartong and one by Swift on Security. Um, and your configuration does matter a lot going into it. Um, when I was doing this, I actually had to switch from Olaf's base config to Swift's base config in order to get the logs I wanted to show. Um, so Sysmon pushes all of it lo its logs it generates into the window microsoft windows sysmon operational event log um, which you can access through the event log viewer or if you have some type of log consolidation or seam or something can easily be pushed into there um, so i wanted to start out by just showing the simple compromise i did to generate the logs that we'll be going through so this is a if you don't know, this is a Metasploit console. Um, I went through, created a, a do Word document with Metasploit that will generate a meterpreter reverse shell. Um, and this is the Kali Linux side. So basically I'm on a terminal server here. I, in the background, I'm on a terminal server that will I'm basically just opening a Word document that has macros enabled. So this could be easily generated from someone logging into a terminal server or an end user opening a document from an email and enabling macros. So if you see here, I had a listener enabled. And then as soon as I opened the Word document, I got a reverse shell that I'm able to run interpreter commands from. First commands I run, or get UID to figure out who I am, get system, which then I do the get UID and shows that I am NT authority system, which is the root access for Windows. So after that, I find what the process ID for the spool service is, and then I'm migrating from the Word document into the spool service executable. And then after that, a background so that I can use two different tools to dump password hashes from the Windows system. First one I use is a smart hash dump, which will dump all of the local user hashes. So you can see here, I got the local administrator password hash and a local admin account password hash all in five seconds from a local admin clicking on a Word document. And then I, the next one I run is, I'm searching for cache because I don't know which one it is. So it's the Windows Gather cache dump, which will dump all password hashes from domain users that are that have current credential saved at the cache. So you can see here, this is my honeypot. So I have a bunch of random names and users, and this is the user and their password hash. So from there, I go back into the interpreter session 
and just dump other IPs from the ARP table. And I do another way that will dump, I think three more IP addresses. But this is a, I think it took me about three minutes and I am not a highly skilled offensive person. So this is three minutes of someone who dabbles but doesn't really know what they're doing. And I just wanted to do this to show you how easy it is to get an initial foothold and dump Windows hashes. So now I'm going to go through the logs generated by that initial compromise. So the first event we see, of course, is the local administrator login at event 4624 from a remote location. So in a normal 4624 event, you won't have the network information if it's logged in locally. But because this is a remote, I don't have it included here, but there is a logon type, which for this would be a logon type three, which is a remote login. So you see, we have the local administrator. This is the computer name that it's on. And coming from my laptop and my IP address, which is a local IP because of course I'm doing this locally. So from this, tracing down the logs, I see a process creation. I did not show the initial win word process opening with which opened a test.docm file, but a few seconds after that opened this process event ID one was generated. So the important things to note from a process creation are the process ID and image. So the because you can continue to track these down through more logs. So the thing I noticed first with this is it creates this random executable file that it's going to be running. That would be a red flag to me. Again, the command line, it shows this executable running from the administrator login. So one big thing I love about sysmon of NID ones is they have file hashes. This event, this isn't going to match anything, but a lot of the exploits out there that have already been discovered, you can take this MD5 or SHA-256 hash, put it into somewhere like Virus Total or Hybrid Analysis, and it will show you what that file that's being executed is. Um, the mpash also allows it to be slightly different and still register. Um, but I am not too familiar with what Impash actually is technically doing. Um, and the other big thing you see is a parent process. So we can see here that this is coming from WinWord, and WinWord is executing a child process, which is a big thing that you don't normally see from WinWord. Um, the command line, you on that last one, you didn't really see much. But in this, I generate this simply by running an encoded command. So you can see it's a PowerShell image. But then if you look at the command line, you see PowerShell.exe encoded command with a bunch of base64 gibberish. This here isn't malicious. It opens up the, pro the process name for Sysmon. But you would not know that looking at this. And this is a big thing you can see from an event ID one. Um, and there's different tools out there that you can use to decode these. If you just pipe it into somewhere that decodes base64, you'll then need to do a little work to read it properly. Um, but also, if you have script block logging enabled on your computer, this will be the script blocks will narrow this down and show you what the actual command is eventually. Um, so then, after that press creation process creation, we have an event ID three, which is network connections. So we can see here that that process ID 5056 with that executable and the administrator login generated a remote login to a IP that we don't know where it is. I know where it is because I initiated it, but say this was some random external IP, 
you can also take this and put it into virus total and if it is a recognized malicious ip you can find it there and a lot of people will go and say hey this was going outbound on my network it's something you need to be checked out so it's a big thing that you can see these destination ips and network connections um, when trying to track down malicious files and malicious connections um, and also another thing i see a lot of people doing is if you have if you are logging network traffic you can see if you're logging with the ids or something in your if you so if you log in network connections you can see that your ip connected to some external ip but you can't see what caused it if you you can then take that destination port and destination ip and collaborate it with these sysmon events and see that oh hey this i this connection i saw in my network traffic came from this image and you can see i mean if this is just like google chrome doc or whatever chrome the exe is then it might be less important than seeing it's this isinahcl.exe which you would definitely need to look more at um so then i'm i did not know about this beforehand but i when i was looking through my logs i saw how the escalation actually happened so when all I was doing in the interpreter shell was typing get system, what it ended up doing was that sin, a, whatever that executable was, created a pipe. Um, and here, this is a normal Windows log, system log that you can see the service created. And this is what it shows you. But the system on log that are generated is, you can see that it set, the target object of that IMQ, IQMRHRE pipe, and then sent a command echo into it. And then the D word difference here is it going from demand start to disabled. This happened after the process was generated. But then if we look at the process, creation of that service running, we see the command line that was run, but we see here that instead of it being the local administrator, this is now running an NT authority system, which if you remember, once I did the get UID after running git system, the pipe allowed my process to then move into NT authority system instead of just running as a local administrator. So there's a lot more you can do if you're running as NT authority system. So then we have our pivot. So this was the events generated by doing that migrate into the spool PID. So we have a cre create remote thread detected, which is an event ID eight on Sysmon. So this is a way that a process can inject itself into another process. So we see here that we have the source process of 5056 and the source image of that ISIN ahlc.exe injecting itself into the spool service, which is 2976. So what this is going to do is instead of all the events being generated by this process they're going to be generated by the spool service so if this process if this isn't caught and you keep looking for this process you won't find anything else you'll have to be looking in the spool service which also you're gonna a lot of stuff is going to be ignoring those logs because it's not a normal log you expect to be looking at so I was actually surprised by how, how few logs were generated by doing all this. So we then move into the exploit. So of I think I tried running through this that the exploit 15 times and only one time did this log trigger. 
So I don't know what caused it to trigger that one time or why it didn't the other 14, because I did the same process in the exploit every time. But we have another current great remote thread, event ID 8. But this time we have the source process ID as a spool service and the source image as a spool service injecting itself into lsass.axe, which is a major red flag anytime a odd process injects itself into it. I honestly don't know a spool, the spool service will normally go into it. But in this case, we can see where the hash were dumped at this time. Um, the LSASS is the local security authority, which verifies a lot, most security events. So users logging into a Windows computer, um, password changes, access tokens, and it stores those hashes whenever you are logged in. Um, so if a process is accessing it that isn't supposed to, it's a major red flag that someone could be trying to get at the password hashes. Um, but like I said, I caught this one of the 15, 20 ish times I ran through that process. Um, so that's going, that literally is all the logs generated through that three minute exploit that ended up with all passwords, both local and domain that were on that terminal server dumped. Um, so Sysmon, you can download from Microsoft.com. It's a part of the system internals tools, which includes a lot of great tools that if you haven't looked into system internals, Look at their tools because there's so much you can do it with them. Um, Trusted Sec has a, put out a Sysmon community guide, which goes through how to install, um, configure, law, configure the configurations, and uh, does a much deeper dive into what Sysmon can do and the capabilities of it. Um, the two major uh, Configurations are done by uh, Olaf Hartong and Swift on Security. This is a link to their GitHub that has each of their Sysmon configs. With Olaf Hartong, you need to run, basically his is modular. So each event idea is broken down into includes and excludes in different folders. And each time you wanna make changes, you then have to rebuild the configuration file. But the, notations for um, rule configs is much more in depth um, and there's a lot it's a lot easier to configure rules but it's also a lot more work to maintain while Swift on securities is great for just a plug and play get it out there get it recording logs um, and then this uh, securityintelligence.com like site was actually where I found out more about that uh, named pipe impersonation that show that the registry logs showed and um, the privilege escalation, which I just found really cool. Um, and then I, you can find me on Discord at I think I'm Dusty on uh, the uh, conference Discord or Dusty M Miller, and then. On Twitter, I'm at Dusty M. Miller. Um, so any questions? Thank you so much, Dusty. I'm checking the Discord right now to see about any questions. Um, there's a lot of compliments in that it's a very good and well-explained talk. So maybe you don't have any questions right now. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, it surprised me. I was expecting a lot more logs generated by that but then every time I'm like oh yeah this this is actually scary how few are generated and the vast majority you wouldn't catch if you didn't have sysmon set up yes yeah, sysmon is definitely a good tool for sure so i will oh there is a question okay any thoughts or recommendations on deploying or updating I think there's a typo, Sysmon on, on or at scale? Um, the way I do it at 
my organization is I have a group policy that runs daily. So it will, there, um, for Sysmon, the installation is like um, sysmon.exe dash I, and then you include the configuration file and then accept the EULA. And then for updating the configuration, it's like sysmon dash C with the configuration file. So the way I do it is through a group policy with um, the configuration file and the install in a shared location, um, which I know the uh, system on community guy by trusted sec recommends against because there's more secure ways to do it. But for me and our organization, it's easier to do it that way. Um, and then trusted sec has a whole section of their system on community guide that will also go through deploying it at scale, but it's really not hard. And I went through our computers in our organization, and I think it used like 27 megabytes of RAM on most computers. So it's not very resource intensive either. Awesome. I think there's one other question in the Discord. It says, would it have been possible to dig into events generated by spoolsv.exe um, to, to see what it was doing after the threat injection? Um, I went through all the logs generated and there weren't, I think part of the issue there was that the spool service is going to be excluded from a bunch of events that it may use regularly. So if that's with the configuration, that's why I said the configuration file is so important because mm -hmm. a lot of stuff will be excluded or included specifically and spool service is one of those that you purposely inject into to kind of remain quiet because it will normally do some logs. Awesome. Well, I don't think we have any other questions at this point. So thank you so much. Thank you guys. Uh, the presenter from you, Rolly Fest. And yep. uh, Yes, and I change. posted the slides in Discord as well, if anyone wants to look through them or for the links for the resources. Oh, thank you so much. Uh